All right, we'll go ahead and start. So allow me to introduce Dr. Laura Elbert. Uh, she comes to us from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she is the Assistant Dean of Graduate Affairs. Uh, and she is also an Associate Professor in the Industrial and Systems Engineering Department there. Uh, she, uh, prior to being at Madison, she was at a university called Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, and prior to that, did her PhD at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. I think I covered all of that background. Yes, you did. Good job. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, she also uh, runs a blog called Punk Rock OR, which is uh, not operating under operations research. Uh, and she uh, gets a lot of press for her work in bracketology, where she uses her background in operations research to predict uh, the winners of the, the basketball tournaments and the football season and all the other sports. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we're coming up on, on selection weekend, I believe, so she'll be probably putting some stuff out there related to that. <laughs> all right. So with that, I'll allow Laura to introduce her topic today and, and tell us all about it. Thanks. Sure. Well, thank you for the warm welcome. I, it's fun to be here. It's my first time at UW-Stout. My PhD is in mechanical and industrial engineering at the University of Illinois, and they now, they've now since split the departments. So now they have a standalone industrial and systems engineering department. But that's like my in to mechanical engineering. I have definitely taken some courses. Um, today I'm going to talk about some of my research. So most of my research deals with public sector problems. My dissertation was on aviation security. Uh, so infrastructure protection. I've done a lot of research on emergency medical services, like routing ambulances and fire trucks to calls to manage risk in uh, public systems and public settings. I've also done research on emergency response after disaster and disaster re recovery and restoration. And in the last few years, I started working on cybersecurity and mainly focusing on how systems engineering can help us secure our critical cyber infrastructure. So this is mostly work with done with my former student, Kay Zhang, who's since graduated and working at Amazon. Um, let's see if my buttons work here. There we go. All right, so I'm also the assistant dean for graduate affairs. So if you have any questions about graduate studies or going on to get a, a degree, well, can, you can ask me afterward. I have some handouts here if you're interested in what UW-Madison has to offer. One of the things we've started recently is a professional master's degrees. So traditionally, we've done the traditional master's degree, which has a big research component. A lot of our students just want a lot of expertise. You need a lot of expertise to get the jobs you want increasingly. Our world is very complex. And so we developed some professional master's de degrees, which are course only, and they don't have a research component, although you can do like an independent study if you want. And the degrees are designed to be completed in a year, although, um, so two semesters in the summer semester. Many students are doing an internship in the summer and finishing within 16 months. And we have 17 different degree options. So we made, um, three are associated with mechanical engineering. So they have mechanical engineering, automotive engineering, and modeling and simulation and mechanical engineering. Uh, but if you're in mechanical engineering and you are interested in focusing on something else, like systems engineering and analytics, that would make me happy. But that's one of our, <laughs> that's one of our programs. You could definitely switch uh, degree programs. A lot of engineers have a common set of knowledge, and you can switch and uh, specialize based on what you're interested in. So I have handouts here afterward. You can ask me general questions about grad school. Is it right for you? You can also ask for the bracket tips after the talk. I will focus on cybersecurity today during the talk. All right, so I wanted to start just explaining what systems engineers do and how we think. And there's a lot of different people that study systems. I'm a systems engineer, and I would define a system as a set of things, which could be people, vehicles, typically in my research, basketball teams in my bracketology research, even cells, and they're connected in a way that they produce their own behavior over time. And so a car is just a single car. A bunch of cars can be a traffic jam. Right? So that's the idea, is that behavior that they produce in the system is different than what we might see in just the individual component. And so we have to study those connections between those things in the system. And I have a slinky here. So if you move one part of the slinky, the whole slinky will move. Right? And so this is 
really what we're studying in systems. If you change one part, it will have these ripple effects and potentially change other things in the system. And there's a science to that, and we study that quite often in industrial and systems engineering. We're increasingly using the word analytics and advanced analytics to study the idea of designing a system, not just studying some of the data. And I'll talk a little bit about that as I start my talk. I will continue this talk by starting with an introduction to my discipline, so at least you can learn what industrial and systems engineers do, and then I'll talk about the cybersecurity. Um, so my field, uh, my specialty is operations research, and that has kind of a strange name, and it's very military sounding because it really grew up during World War II. So in World War II, people started using math to solve these problems, uh, these military problems, and it was really looking at bombing strategies and surveillance strategies typically. You can't be everywhere at once. You have to be clever with how you're going to do some surveillance for um, uh, for the uh, discovering the enemy or keeping people safe. And afterward, after World War II in the late 40s and 50s, there was an explosion of computing power, if you can believe it. And they started to understand how that they could use these methods and algorithms that had just been designed at that time to more cost-effectively move troops and supplies over these big transportation networks. Uh, military operations are really, really, really expensive. So if you can save like that much, it's a lot of money. Right? Like 1% of a big number is a big number. And so these methods were really successful. Okay, so some of the applications we're still doing are very similar to that. So early days in operations research, we're really focused on these transportation problems, moving the troops around. And we're still focusing on transportation problems quite a bit. One of the big wins for our discipline was is airline scheduling, crew scheduling. What happens when there's a snowstorm and O'Hare cancels about a bunch of flights? They have to get everybody to their destinations. And we have the tools to solve those types of problems. Uh, railroad scheduling is a big one, too. Um, and there's a lot of different modes of transportation that are involved in, that basically use our tools. Uh, manufacturing is one where there's a lot of overlap with mechanical engineering. So we don't make the stuff. We make the stuff just, we make it more efficient. So it's like the soft side of the uh, manufacturing process. So instead of like optimizing one little part of the system, you know, we just make sure that the whole system, manufacturing system, works very efficiently. So we do a lot of queuing theory and some other tools are, are, are in there. Um, the big place our graduates are going right now is healthcare. It's probably true for mechanical engineers. I know many who go and, and, and develop medical devices. Well, we have really great medicine in this country. What we don't have is great healthcare delivery, right? So it's one part medicine, one part healthcare delivery. We need both things to be in place to have a really efficient and effective healthcare system. And so things like scheduling doctors and scheduling appointments, when they call and they ask you to verify your address like six times to make an appointment, those are all things that we could do a little bit more efficiently. And we're increasingly using a lot of these, these tools um, that we have in industrial engineering. And we do a lot of fun and exciting things too. So the sharing economy has really uh, there's been an explosion of these really interesting, hard, complex optimization problems that uh, come up come about in the sharing economy. So this is a picture. We have bike sharing. Like, there's always a bike available. Like, how is there always a bike available? It's not an accident. So if you just design the network, everybody would take the bikes, and then you'd go to some other hub, and you wouldn't have a place to plug in your bike, right? So there's a lot of complex interactions that happen to sort of balance the system out uh, pretty well. So we're working on a lot of interesting different applications. And I've started looking at some of the sharing economy issues for disaster response. And I should, be, I should be making millions of dollars with my ideas, but usually I'm just trying to help people and keep us safe. All right, so one thing that you should be aware of is our world is increasingly complex and connected. And so a lot of the tools that we use are very math-based, they're mathematical models, and these really help us understand the world that we operate in. I've heard that the world runs on eighth grade math, and, uh, which is a little sobering. <laughs> so when you go into the work world, you'll, you'll see a lot of eighth grade math being used to make big decisions. But if you know more than that, you have, there's such a big opportunity to make a big difference. Right? So you don't, it's helpful to have a PhD, but you don't always need a PhD to make a big difference. Uh, so I'm an advocate of mathematical models and systems thinking. I was trying to explain to you know, non-engineers, like, what is it that we really do? And a lot of times I think about uh, what we actually do in every single day. 
And we're usually looking at different criteria when we're trying to solve a problem, right? So we want to make a system work really well, which is what we call effectiveness. But we always have costs and constraints, right? And so we're trying to weigh the two. And quite often, at least in industrial engineering, we're trying to find efficient solutions, which kind of takes effectiveness over cost. And how do you get the most bang for your buck? How do you get the best performance given these constraints and inputs? Uh, and that's quite often uh, how we approach the design process. That's how other design engineers also approach the design process. But that comes all out in the research quite a bit. And you'll see that a little bit in my talk uh, today. Uh, so some of you are, might be wondering, like, how do I know that my problem is a systems problem? Right? So that's kind of a, a complicated situation. And if you tell me about a problem, I'll give you the answer. But there's a few key ingredients that we see quite often in systems problems where I know it's probably going to be something that can benefit from my toolkit as an industrial engineer. One of them is queues and congestion. So I mentioned that traffic jam earlier. Right? So that's usually something is very inefficient. Right? We, the system has a limited resource. And if the roads were wider, if their light was longer, or there were sometimes fewer drivers on the road, you know, we, there wouldn't be a traffic jam. We see queues and congestion all the time. I mentioned the emergency room, your doctor's office. Um, who has waited in line recently? You know, the grocery checkout line. I see queues everywhere. I see congestion everywhere. And these are usually systems that um, maybe are, don't have enough resources to operate efficiently. We also have limited capacities and supplies. So I'm like the expert at figuring out how to maximize performance with limited resources. But sometimes it's pretty challenging, even then. A lot of what we focus on is discrete decisions. So I mentioned ambulances and fire trucks earlier. You can only open one station in one place. You can only open a new school in one place. Sometimes it would be easier to just please everybody and have this school be located in a different building on a different day of the week, right? But we can't do that. The school has to be in one place. And that actually makes decisions a lot harder. Uh, I mentioned airline scheduling earlier. Airlines only have so many seats in them, and you can't like squeeze another person in, right? They only have 150 seats, you can only put 150 passengers on them. Otherwise, you need an entirely new plane, and that's really expensive. And so sometimes it's like you just want to like change everything to use the, the planes that you have to get passengers moved around, and that's pretty complex. And then finally, there's a lot of uh, delays. Delays due to travel. Delays due to processing and waiting for a test result to come back, um, information. So a lot of what we're doing now is sequen uh, making personalized healthcare decisions, but there's a lot of waiting and doctor's appointment scheduling. If you do an observation in the emergency department, everybody gets a CT scan, right? So then there's a queue there, and then you're waiting on different nurses and doctors to collect test results and make decisions. And meanwhile, there's only so many beds in the emergency department, and that causes things to back up. So we have the tools to address those types of situations. All right, so when I usually talk with people about a new problem, like, oh, they need to improve some efficiency, they always just have this dial. They sort of just dial up performance. And of course, we just want to dial up performance and maximize performance. But in general, right, everything I've described in the last slide is pretty complex. We have limitations, right? Change this one part of the system and it's ripple effects somewhere else. And so under the hood, I'm doing a complex mathematical optimization to balance all the trade-offs, the criteria, the limited resources, and to improve performance. So I will open the hood up a little bit today. I tried to take most of the math out, but I love math, so I left some of it in. So bear with me on those couple of slides that are a little mathy, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about cybersecurity today. All right, so you might be curious about data analytics. And Engineering is increasingly data-driven. In mechanical engineering, all of our engineering disciplines. And we hear so much about data science, and I think data science is very useful, but as engineers, sometimes we have a different take on it. And I would say the data are just data, right? So it's usually just a bunch of numbers, or it's text, or it's something that we can organize. And the point of all that data is to turn it into information so it's useful. So that's where like the data science typically comes in. Uh, but as an engineer, I want to solve a problem, right? And the information is giving me knowledge, but it's not really helping me to solve a problem or design something new or take action. And so I really want to apply advanced analytics to that data and that information, solve a problem, and make a better decision. And it's usually involving designing and operating a system. And it's a little bit hard to move from that data to a, optimizing a complex system. 
I'll do my best to talk about that today. Uh, in terms of uh, data-driven engineering, I like to think of the spectrum of moving from data to insight to decision. And there's actually different tools that we use uh, on different areas of this. So you might have had courses in some of these areas. But the first, the data part of, is really answering the question, what happened and why? Right? So we take some data, we're sort of looking in the past a lot in data and statistics. It's very backward looking. What happened and why? So statistics is the typical tool that helps us answer that question. Increasingly artificial intelligence, machine learning, data visualization, those will always help us look back and figure out what happened in the past. And sometimes that's really valuable to know what happened in the past. To get more insight, we ask questions like what will happen? So looking at forecasting, simulations, like forecast the college football playoff. This is kind of where I'm at, this blue part. Most of my research is over here in the orange part, which is really well aligned with what engineers do. So what should we do? How do we design a system? What should we do differently that we're not doing today? It's very forward-looking. Engineers tend to be very forward-looking. Let's, let's design a new system. Let's design something to solve a problem. Whereas my friends in statistics are a little bit more looking backward. Um, that's kind of a difference between the two. So this is my research over here. We, we're calling that prescriptive analytics because I'm prescribing something. And I've got my picture of a slinky because this is the part of the spectrum that really deals with this, these complex interconnected systems. Okay. Uh, one point is these are all really important things to do and be different people need to do them. And so increasingly engineers are working with statisticians on the spectrum to solve engineering problems. Uh, I was also trying to explain what we do in optimization that might be different from mechanical engineering. Um, so I try, this is my general approach to the problem. Um, so a lot of our optimization models, as I mentioned before, have some kind of discrete or integer variables. So I mentioned that the school can only be located in one of two sites. You can't like have school half the time in two different locations. There tends to be a lot of structure to the problem. So I have some pictures of graphs, and you'll see some structure later on. And we tend to solve problems that are not physics-based. So we're not measuring momentum in our models. We look at some of these connections. And I'll talk about an example with cybersecurity later on. And we also try to solve problems that are, from a theoretical point of view from computer science, that are difficult to solve. And sometimes in computer science, they will shy away from some of those, and they'll try to only look at problems that they can solve very quickly and we really solve the complex, messy ones. Sometimes it takes a while. All right, so how do we do this? Well, a lot of the advances in our field focus on designing these specialized algorithms that are in software. They're not typically available on your phone, uh, but we usually solve, sometimes the models take a day or so to solve. We also have a lot of tailored optimization algorithms. And the point of all of these is they look at the structure of the problem. So we have, I have had those pictures of those graphs with those interconnections. We exploit the structure and then we can solve it more quickly. And we can actually solve a lot of these problems that are supposedly theoretically hard to solve. We can solve them in sometimes a second or two. It blows my mind. Um, some of them we can't. So some of them once my research are still difficult to solve. And then we try to make improvements. All right, so that's kind of our, our big advances. Um, so that's a place, I, you can come back to that later. That's sort of an introduction to what we do in industrial and systems engineering, especially in my <laughs> subdiscipline of operations research, which is really solving these you know, complex problems on a, on a network, typically. I want to switch gears and talk about my actual research in cybersecurity, which is pretty interesting. I'm excited to hear that NSA has a center here and, uh, with cybersecurity, and that's actually kind of aligned with my talk today. Um, so my talk today was actually motivated from, by some work at Federal, uh, a federal research lab. And uh, cybersecurity has been a big topic for a while. Supply chain security has been a more recent topic. And so this is a picture of the White House. I will say it's Obama's White House because all of this came out under the Obama administration. But they were really looking at protecting our networks. When you think about cybersecurity, I will, I'm, I will say that I'm guilty of thinking of like some guy in a hoodie typing away and hacking into the network. And, you know, that's true. There's a lot of that. <laughs> There's also a lot of other risks that enter. And if you actually look at some of the big risks lately, it's not the guy in the hoodie. It's in the supply chain. So we have a globalized supply chain. And there are risks that happen out there that are totally not connected to our cyber infrastructure that end up 
filtering into our network. I have, I have some pictures that will explain it too. And that's what really what we're trying to protect. Like how can we design a system that over time really prevents a lot of those risks from entering the system. Um, and there's been a lot of work. This has been a national priority for the last decade or so. So I'm a little bit of a Venn diagram enthusiast. So I, my, I came up with this Venn diagram. And I mentioned earlier that I've done a lot of Homeland Security research. And I started talking to somebody from a national lab about this. And I thought that cybersecurity would be like a subset of <coughs> Homeland Security. And once I looked into it, cybersecurity is uh, a really big issue. And I, I'm, I'm much more well versed in it now. I have an Alexa device at home and there's no security on that thing. So if you really want to mess with somebody in their Alexa device, um, put reminders and alerts on their calendar for the future like when they're in the bathroom. Right? Nothing's stopping you from doing that. And uh, it's a little disturbing to me. We joke about it, but what if you have a smart healthcare device? You know, just think about it. So cybersecurity is really important. I don't, I'm not going to address those things. Those are just topics for you to think about. Those are things that are over here. Um, and I'm really interested in actually protecting, thinking about protecting cyber infrastructure to, for national security. So I'm interested in that overlap. And then supply chain security, again, it's a huge topic. And I'm really interested in like this area, so there's Bucky, where everything overlaps. Right? But there's a lot of opportunity in these other areas outside of this overlap. Uh, between these three topics. Okay, so I know the most about Homeland Security and it's been interesting learning about the other two. Okay, so I have a lot of slides, like what is the problem type slides here. And supply chain attacks are becoming a, uh, more common. And so this is why they've become a topic of national concern. And they're adversarial attacks. They can be sort of accidental. They're sophisticated, hard to detect, and likely have severe consequences. So unlike a lot of Homeland Security research, what we see more from the cybersecurity side is the uh, theft of information. And the information could be worth billions of dollars. So there's a big price tag attached to it. There's generally not a body count. Um, there's not a death toll. Those things that I've looked at other, in other aspects of my research. But the, there can be a lot of information that's stolen. Okay, so the target data breach, which uh, just a few years ago uh, involved a third party vendor who stole credentials and was able to get into the system. Right? So it was this vendor over there that's part of the supply chain. The US Office of Personnel and Management had a data breach. It's just a lot of federal employees. Um, they have security clearances and that type of thing. Uh, so 22 million uh, employees lost their information and they exploited vulnerabilities by a contractor and stealing credentials and inserting malware into the, you know, into the supply chain. Okay, so you'll see a lot of stealing credentials from these people that work over in the supply chain space. And sometimes it's maintenance, right? People that do maintenance can in insert vulnerabilities. And over time, it's like we would like those vulnerabilities not to happen or be exploited so frequently. All right, so what are some examples of supply chain vulnerabilities? Um, we can look at hardware that already has malware on it. So, you know, where did that hardware come from? Well, you know, it's tricky, uh, but it could be intercepted from legitimate suppliers. Two companies could sell you the same product that was designed, at the, that was manufactured at the same plant. And so you have to be careful, right? This is where the globalized supply chain comes into to play. There's a lot of sharing and overlap in that space. Um, there's counterfeit computer hardware or software. Uh, that can lead to problems in a number of different ways. There's other things that aren't really nefarious, just like the disruption of the production of a critical product or service. Right? So if something's really important to you and you can't do your job, and there's an, interrup inter uh, it's a, there's an interruption in production, and it's unavailable, then that can be introduced some, uh, some risks. And then I mentioned malicious or unqualified service providers. So a lot of times they're maybe not unqualified or sloppy, and then somebody that is malicious takes advantage. And that is what we saw in the previous examples, legitimate vendors who were exploited. So people are usually the biggest, biggest risk. Um, so the vulnerabilities could be intentional or unintentional, right? So they're all risks. We can quantify, we can break them down and look at them. But uh, what we can't do is we can't just uh, adopt simple policies like just buy American because we just buy American sometimes with the globalized supply chain 
we're still introducing the same risks. We're just doing it through the same American company that's now giving us the counterfeit <coughs> hardware, the hardware with malware installed on it. Right? So that's one of the challenges when we really want to think about breaking this down. So I'm going to trip over this chair a little bit here. But our, our goal is like over a long period of time, how do we design a process that really enhances supply chain security? So how does a federal lab use its budget this year to identify the most critical things that they should do? There's nothing real time about this. There could be a guy in a hoodie somewhere that's involved in all of this, but most of the time this is sort of a slow moving decision process. All right, so I like a lot of pictures. So this is another picture. Um, so basically this is the network that we want to pr pr uh, protect, our critical infrastructure with in information layer, but we're not really acting in this space. Right? We're acting up here, which is the supply chain, our transaction and logistics layer. And there's some linkages here. You know, you have to replace a part, you have to do maintenance, the server needs to be replaced. And then there's an oversight layer where we have different government agencies. It's mostly NIST, and I forget what NIST stands for, uh, but also the federal labs will also oversee security in a number of areas. And so that leads us to the second, this fourth layer in here which is the attack layer, which is what I'm going to explicitly model in my research. I'll show you some pictures of that. And so there could be a, an attack requires a series of events to be undertaken, right? So it's not just here's an attack, right? We look at all the different things they have to do to carry that out. I only have to intercept one of those pieces. And if I don't intercept one of those pieces, it will have a linkage over here that will reduce a risk into the supply chain, which will eventually come down here and <coughs> exploit our network. So that's really what the problem is all about. I have these mitigations over here is what I can do about it. And they can be doing stuff, but it's often about policy and process. Um, but there is things like tamper evident packaging like requiring that, that is very physical. We need mechanical engineers to design that type of thing that will help protect or at least make evident when something's been tampered with. We don't unintentionally introduce a risk. Right? So there are all these linkages that happen. Um, so I started working on this, and it was really because a lot of these really simple policies were proposed like by American, and, and uh, there really wasn't a good framework for supply chain risk management. And so it was described to me as, you know, we know what good security looks like, we just don't know how to get there. And what we want to do to get there is to identify security mitigations, which could be policies, which could be um, training, which could be actual physical things like the tamper evident packaging. But the question is, how do we get the right mix of things? Like we don't want to duplicate effort. Like these are two really good ideas, but they kind of duplicate effort and do the same thing. Uh, we wanted to look at what happens if I could do this, I'm not sure it's really going to work the way I think it's going to work. Can I take that uncertainty into account? Those are all the things that we want to look at. And I uh, discussed this with some stakeholders. They mentioned that Basically, mitigations do two things. They help prevent something bad from happening. They can either make it harder by increasing the difficulty of the attack, or they can reduce the consequences of the attack. And there are ways to reduce the consequences of an attack, which I mentioned earlier, which is usually theft of information. It's hard to really reduce the value of that. There are certain things that you could do, like forensics after something has been happened that you can like recover quickly. But in general, mitigations increase the difficulty of the attack. So that's all I'm going to focus on in today's attack, but there is another side to this. Okay, so our contributions, I will talk a little bit about the coverage models, but mostly I'll talk about the results and show you some pictures. And this is about maximi uh, maximally covering attack paths. So we focus on our uh, system, which is going to be the system of attacks, and we've uncertain mitigation effectiveness. So we don't really know, we know the things that we are uncertain about. And initially, I won't have an adversary that says, all right, I see what you're going to do, and I'm going to do something else. And the second model I'll show you will have adaptive adversaries. We're trying to complete an attack project as quickly as possible, and we're trying to delay that, that project as much as we can by strategically making some choices. All right, so we use a threat scenario analysis framework, and it's basically a structured way to break this attack down into a series of steps, and then we look at what specific mitigation will affect this attack. Like, I know it will attack this attack, but which step will it affect? And that helps us provide the structure and look at the connections in the system. 
So I'm going to move on to this picture here. This could be a type of attack, and we have and nodes or or nodes okay, in this type of attack. So there's a lot of structure here. And there's some possible mitigations. So I need to sort of like push off all the possibilities off into the future as much as possible. And I say, let's say I can't prevent everything really well. I don't have something that won't work, but I have these four things, and they'll each affect a step here. And so we initially started working by taking that tree and dividing it into all the paths. These are all the ways somebody could launch an attack. So each one of these rows is a different attack. And so sometimes they're only two steps, and sometimes they're all, felt, all uh, six. And everything has node one in here, but this is just sort of an artificial node. We have to have a, we have a tree, right? So we have, there's no way to prevent node one, unfortunately. Um, but that we could look at our mitigations. Okay, so this is our mitigation. So if I could only choose one of these mitigations, which one should I choose? Do you know? Possibly the green one. Why the green one? Well, there are three that have three, yep. and then that's the one the earliest in the stage. Yep. So that might be earlier, so that might be some criteria. Criteria prevent things early on. That doesn't So I've sort of unintentionally not given you all the right information. Like, what are the costs of, of these? Right. We, so I think we're, we want to cover as many nodes as possible. But what if it's like super expensive to cover one more node? Then maybe, maybe not. Okay. So what if I had to pick two? Okay. Depends on the cost. You could probably see what not to do. I probably wouldn't want to choose those two. Because duplicating effort. Okay, so maybe the green one and the orange one might be a good pair, cost not being an issue. Right? So this is how we sort of break it, break it down. Um, but let's say it's really, uh, some of these attack paths are really easy to implement and some are harder. Right? So that also plays into it a little bit. So some have more risk associated with it. And let's say we're not so, not so certain about how some of these mitigations will work. We might actually want to double up some cases. It's a really, really easy otherwise. And we're not sure if the first mitigation is going to work, then we really need that second one to work. And so the answer is, it really depends. It depends on the data that we get. So we work with subject matter experts, and they come up with these trees. And then we look at what mitigations they have, what steps they'll, they'll react. Some of the preliminary, we get fake data from the, the federal labs. Some of the preliminary data said that they're pretty sure some of these were going to work and have like the attack the control, and some they were less sure. And so we're able to incorporate that into the model. Um, so this is basically how we start approaching things and break things down. Um, there's a lot of math here. I'm going to sort of skip it because, anyway, so there's, there's a math model. It's a stochastic optimization model, which means there's uncertainty, and that makes it really hard. Um, I want to say a little bit about the results is that we we're able to, to prove, so there are even proofs in my work. We're able to prove that some of these algorithms, they don't give us the optimal solution, but we can bound how close they get to the optimal solution. And one works in order m squared time, where m is the number of mitigation. And one takes more time, but it gets us a better, guarantees a better quality solution. Okay. So then we actually solved these to optimality, found the optimal solution, looked at our approximation algorithm. We found that the first algorithm it's just a greedy algorithm. It works really, really quick. It takes usually a second or two. Um, and Gurobi's a state-of-the-art optimization solver. It basically got within 3% of the optimal solution every single time. It usually found the optimal solution. The second algorithm is really nice mathematically. It's beautiful. It gives us better solution guarantees. But we basically can't solve it. It just takes too The order, if we have to go, that's just too long, that time. So that one didn't work. Um, but we ended up finding some nice solutions, too. One of the interesting things that we have, that you always have to make sure you solve the right problem for the decision maker, is in the federal government, they get money for things, usually annually, or you know, so they have to spend their money this federal year. And then they'll get another budget next year, which will also help supply chain security. So our problem is that, well, tell me your budget, and we'll tell you which mitigations to use. And and then if you tell, give me a bigger budget, I will probably tell you a different mix of mitigations. Right? That's not very useful. They say, well, I want part of the solution this year, and then I'll finish the solution next year when I get my budget. 
And so this algorithm uh, that we use, which is this green line, gives us what's called like a prioritized list, and it gives us nested solutions, which are really, really helpful if you're a federal decision maker, because I can implement part of the solution this year and then part of it next year, and you're not going to tell me next year, like, oh, too bad. Now that I know this year's budget, you should have done everything differently last year, um, which is one of the features of our models quite typically. Okay, so we want things to actually be useful for the person that's uh, implementing them. All right, so this was a really interesting problem, but it made some simplifications of the problem. Like you always kind of get the same amount of credit for uh, implementing a mitigation. But I mentioned that some of those attack paths were easier than, and some were harder, right? And so if we really want to like push things off into the future, we couldn't really directly address this. And we want to model adversaries. But if you're trying to achieve a goal and somebody's trying to thwart you, you can imagine that that optimization model is very complex. And if you're taking game theory, a lot of the problems are very small, right? And combinatorially, we have this enormous decision space. And that's one of the challenges in this research. Um, but what's really cool, if we have this graph structure, there are some models and algorithms where we can solve really, really large-scale games really quickly. And we wanted to use some of those ideas here. And we actually formulated a new model, coming back to this tree and this path idea. Um, and what the new model does is it leaves everything in this tree form, right? So we really wanted to look at, like, what's the quickest that they could carry out this attack? That's what they're going to do. And I actually want to prevent those exploits along that path, which is their quickest path to the finish line. I, those are the ones I want to prevent or delay. We're going to look at these in terms of delaying. And the other ones, they can take a little bit longer. Now, this... That idea is usually seen in a non-adversarial setting. It's project management. You might take a management course here. It's a critical path method. It's like a basic industrial engineering and operations management course that's taught. It's a basic model. Uh, we wanted to use it, have an adversary actually carrying out the project, and we want to thwart that adversary. <laughs> so it's like kind of turning that basic project, project management stuff on its head. Um, and that's what we're going to do here. And that really helps us sort of manage these different paths, and there's different ways to carry out an attack. Um, but what we have here is that the attacker actually has to do all of these things, and some of them they have to can wait. They can figure out that stuff later. It's not going to delay the whole project, but there is something very critical. If there's a delay here, it's going to delay the entire project. And so this is a, a tool that's widely used in manufacturing as well. Okay, so this is the, ba the basic idea, and I tried to break it down. So this is an example. You can see the bold face line is like, it's actually the longest path from A to L. Like that's how long the project is going to take. So I can delay this arc here, and it's not going to delay the overall project. But if I delay this one, it will. Right? We want to delay, we want to delay these successful attacks. Um, so this is our attack graph model. So we've got the nodes, the arcs, the longest path. It is a zero-sum network game. So we have a bunch of attackers. So we have a bunch of these graphs, and they all are trying to complete their attack as quickly as possible. And we want to push those all off into the future. That's called a zero-sum game. You know, I win when they lose. So if the more I delay the project, it's just good for me, it makes it worse for them. And this is like a one-shot game. So we're not going to play the game a bunch of different times. The adversaries are very adaptive in this sense, so it's a little bit tricky to find the right model. But basically, for now, we're going to deal with these ad adversaries, and then in the future, they'll adapt to these defenses, and we'll kind of deal with that later. Uh, but we do deal with the idea of many attackers. And most of the research focuses on one defender and one attacker, which is reasonable for a lot of Homeland Security applications, but there's a lot of bad actors in the cybersecurity space. Okay, so how does this work? So the defender acts first, and we pick some of these arcs. We have mitigations, just like we have before, that act on potentially multiple arcs, as you saw from the picture, and that just delays them. You can think about it lengthening these arcs. Maybe this one goes from six to eight. And the attacker can say, all right, well, now that I've seen how you're going to delay the project, I'm going to like restructure my project, and I'm going to do my project management technique, and I'm going to figure out the best way that I can complete this attack. And, and hurt you and steal your information. Okay, so that's what their recourse decision is. So they really need to see what we're doing to see what they should be doing. All right, so we're still answering the same question, like how do we find the best mix of mitigations? And so what happens is that we start delaying 
the critical path and give delayed parts in the network, we have to start protecting different parts of the network at different levels of the budget. Right? And so we get some insight into what parts of the network need the most protection. And that's the, the one of the key contributions. Okay, so there's, there's also a big a complicated mathematical model here. One thing to note here is that we're going to maximize performance on the top, um, and then the adversaries are trying to minimize the time to complete every project. Okay, so we can't just like pop this into the software and solve this. So how do we deal with this? Well, there's a lot of theory that goes into this. All that stuff in the textbook comes from somewhere, and it's interesting. Um, so what we do is we reformulate the model so we can... Uh, it's a, the equivalent model, it just is structured differently, and so we can, exp, uh, we can solve it. So we exploit the structure, we reformulate that maximization problem, we can use all of these theories and elegant theories of mathematics to solve, reformulate that as a maximization problem, then we have a maximize and maximize, and so there's congruence there, and then we can use optimization <coughs> algorithms. Okay. So our structure was a little bit unique in this case, and all right, so we end up getting a max-max problem. It's still too hard to solve. Okay, I've made it better, but it's still too hard to solve. It's still too painful. So then we decompose the problem. So we're going to, like, relax it a little bit. And instead of having, like, one maximization problem, one optimization problem to rule them all, we decompose this into a series of many problems. Um, I can't quite point this out, but it's 1 plus P. So P is, like, the number of projects, adversarial projects. And then omega is like the uncertainty, right? So those, that's potentially a pretty big number, right? But I, now I'm solving like all these little optimization problems. They don't talk to each other, so they're decomposed. And then I don't have to consider all these interactions in that big network. I just have to consider like this. And I can do this really, really fast. And I do this a bunch of times, and I can solve. I generally cannot solve the exact optimal solution, but I can get something really close. And if I popped it into the software, it doesn't even give me like a good guess within an hour. Sometimes it doesn't even find a single feasible solution. Um, so I don't know. That's everybody finds things beautiful. I think that's pretty beautiful to me. Um, so that's kind of my summary of the research. That's really what the contribution is: is thinking through all this and figuring out how to solve these incredibly difficult problems. I have tables of running times that I could show you, but instead I thought I'd show you a picture. So this is one that I was coming, I came up with recently. So you have two attackers, and you could have like you know that one node that connects them both, and you could have one node here on the bottom if you want. Um, but let's say that this first guy has three exploits, and then there's what five over here, right? So this project would take five units of time to complete, and then over here you can go from one to two to three. If they've got wiggle room of like one unit of time in there, and, and they'll still finish the project in five time units. And then over here we kind of have this zigzaggy completion time, it's in bold face, it takes a completion time of six, okay? So I'm just going to add those together for simplicity and say, like, the total time is 11 time units, and I just want to push them all off into the future. Okay, but let's say I have three mitigations now, and I have, like, the, let's see, like, a plus two, so this is, can be delayed by two time units by mitigation one or mitigation two, right? So you only get credit for one mitigation because each exploit is, like, exploited by this some kind of mechanism, and you only can exploit that once, right? And I only can thwart that in one way. And so if I want to thwart a project in multiple ways, I have to target multiple arcs. Okay, so the question is, like, what's the best way to delay this project? All right, well, that's complicated. So I've got, the, I've got it all written out for you. So let's go with, through the three mitigations. Let's just say they cost the same amount. So this is mitigation one. So it delays the first project over here, and now it takes time six. And you can see the critical path changes, right? From this guy over here, one to three, to one to two to three. And then over here, if I choose mitigation one, it delays this one arc, but that actually doesn't delay the project at all. So the critical path is the same, the project's not delayed. This is what we were missing in the first model, that I could do something and it might not really make a meaningful difference at the end. So this is why networks really matter. Um, so the total project was delayed by 1 to 12. Okay, mitigation 2. Okay, completion time over here is 6. I'm delaying this arc over here. Two arcs get delayed over here, and the critical path changes, and the completion time becomes 7. So the total time is 13. Okay, so that's better. 
And then mitigation three delays two arcs. And let's see, it delays this first project by two time units and the second project by one time unit. And our total time is 14. Okay, so this is the best choice, mitigation number three. Okay, and you can see that in this case, uh, this, neither one of the critical paths changed. Now, if I want to add a second mitigation, this is kind of what we came at before. Tell me your budget, and I'll tell you the right mix of mitigations. Turns out if we can pick two mitigations, we want to pick mitigations one and two. They work better together. And now the total time is 15. I think if we chose either of the other two mitigations, the completion time would be 14. So it's, it's one better. And you can see all the arcs that get delayed here. right? And some of them don't actually end up the, the affecting the final completion time. Um, but we, we ought to find the right mix. right? So this is a complicated problem. But this is a good tool to help us figure out how to, to solve these problems. And we have the algorithm that we can get pretty good answers within a few minutes. We tried running this for 24 hours. I'll say without our algorithms, even that's not enough time. These are really, really hard problems to solve. <coughs> All right. So I think that's a good time to sort of wrap things up on the cybersecurity side. Uh, so as you see in my research, I use a lot of math modeling. I apply engineering principles to complex problems that I think make a difference and it'll help keep us safe. And some of my other research, I look at how to route and locate ambulances and fire trucks, especially when you get the right mix of vehicles that you have to send to patients. Finding the right mix is much more complicated than just sending the right ambulance and picking which station should respond. Um, and I've done uh, aviation security and I'm doing a lot of work on network restoration. So what happens if that those network pictures I showed you, what if they're impaired, like after a disaster? How do you optimally recover the network while also providing service? Um, so a lot of people need critical medicine or help after a disaster and you really need to sort of solve both of those problems together. Um, so I didn't talk a lot about data analytics today, but I like to talk about bracketology because that's it. we actually use actual data from games to inform decisions. And believe it or not, those methods are useful for engineering decisions as well as winning your office pool. Um, but it was a pleasure talking with you today. I'm looking forward to the questions you'll have after the talk. So I will let Dr. Berg kind of take things over and right. things from there. Thank our speaker. Thank you.